So in the uh, previous two weeks of this series, as you're getting ready to turn, uh, you know, uh, turn there, um, we saw that where Paul is compelling the Hebrew Christians to not return to the old ways. He's saying, you know what, why would you go back to the old ways? Why are you going to like worship angels? Why are you going to do all these things, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing sacrifices and diverse washing, court ordinances, all those things. He says, don't do that. Why? Because you have Jesus. He says, there's no reason for you to go back to those things. You don't have to do that. And for the non-believing Hebrews, he's telling them not to uh, also to, to not worship or to hold angels up in high regard or in high esteem, but to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because he is better. And so this week, we're going to look into different aspects of salvation. Not that there's different ways to get saved, but how Christ has saved us and what he went through to save us to the, other, uh, to the uttermost. Amen? And so, if, like I said, if you have your Bibles, we're in Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 1, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. It says, Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which uh, we have heard, lest at any time we should uh, let them slip. For if the word spoken by, uh, by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began uh, to, uh, to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and uh, gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not uh, put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Verse 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou, uh, uh, crowned, thou uh, crowned him with glory and honor, and uh, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we, uh, we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should, uh, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are, whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in being a many sons unto glory, to make the, uh, the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause it, he is not ashamed to call them brethren." saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy that that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who, uh, who, through, uh, who through fear of death were all their uh, lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his, uh, his brethren, that he might be a merciful and high, uh, faithful high priest, in things pertaining to God, to make a reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that, that are tempted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts. And God, that, you, uh, that we would give, the, uh, give heed to your word, that we would do your word. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us and empower us. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my sermon this morning is, How Shall We Escape If We Neglect So Great Salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Number one is this, is don't neglect this great salvation. 
is the fact that oftentimes people will look at this and see this and begin to sit there and think, well, this is a, you know, a possibility that a person can, can lose their salvation or they lost their salvation. No, neglect doesn't mean that. Neglect just means that, you know what, you're not giving attention to it. It's kind of like if you, do, uh, you know, if you don't do anything to your house or if a house just sits there, what happens? It doesn't get better, does it? It gets worse. Despite what evolution will teach you, it doesn't get better. It gets worse and worse the longer it sits there, and eventually nature will overtake that building and will make it a part of the earth once again, right? That's the reason why we have ruins everywhere and everything else, because the earth, they were left there to ruin, and the earth overtook them as they were. Now, for, uh, in this uh, portion of Scripture, and, I, and I, uh, I forgot to bring this up last week, is that what you may see in here is that the angels that are referred to in these first four verses and in uh, chapter 1, but also throughout Hebrews, uh, all throughout uh, Hebrews, you know, that book could not, uh, could, uh, could not only be referring to celestial angelic beings as angels as we know it, but could also be referring to prophets, and especially though, uh, since the term angel was implied to not only angelic beings, but also to prophets and priests, since the term only means messenger, whether or not it's human or it's supernatural. All right, and so and you begin to see this as you go through it. it that it, it makes sense that it could also be for prophets, for priests, for believers. Because why? Because we're all uh, we're all supposed to be messengers of the gospel, right? We're all supposed to be giving that message. And so whether you believe it was just angels or whether you believe it was angels and and humans, doesn't really matter. All right, but I'm just saying in this case, you know, when you read this, you can see how it can apply to both. You'll see how it, you know, it, it can do that. And like I said, we'll see throughout uh, the remainder of this chapter and obviously the, the entire book of Hebrews that it could very well mean both. It could have that dual meaning or it could be one or the other, right? So just so you know, in the book of Haggai, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 13, it talks about Haggai being an angel. Uh, uh, and, and then Malachi chapter 2, verse 7, it refers to a priest having that same kind of thing as a messenger. And then also in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it talks about a messenger who, uh, who is to prepare the way of the Lord. So we see it you know, in the Bible that it's not just this instance that this happens, all right, where the Bible will call somebody an angel. And oftentimes, sometimes, I think that's where you know, people get this idea of, well, you're an angel sent. Or, or when a person passes away, they'll sit there and say, well, I got my wings. You know, the Bible's just calling you a messenger. That's all it is. It's not saying you're getting wings or you're getting anything else. I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to fly like an angel. But you know what? When we're raptured, you know, out of here, we will all fly. Amen? Yes. And so, what is it? You know, he says in verse 1, he says, we ought to give the more earnest heed. We ought to focus, we ought to listen, we ought to give our attention to what we have heard. Why? Because we don't know how long it is before, you know, persecution would happen. Remember, uh, and as I believe that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, he's writing this because of persecution to the Hebrew Christians. Or the fact that he's also writing it to uh, Hebrews that are not saved. And so he's, you know, saying, you know what? Be prepared. You ought to give earnest heed. Why? Because those things that you listen to, that you honestly will sit there and take the time to, uh, to give heed to, to give attention to, you remember. I mean, think about it. The songs that you like, you remember them. The songs you don't like, you remember them. <laughs> and some of you look at me, you know, kind of strange. Why is that? Go into a store. There's a song that will come up on the, on the, on the overhead, you know, that you're going... I hate this song, but then in your head, you'll have that song in your head the rest of the day. And you're like, I don't really want to give heed to that, but you know what? It won't go away. Um, but that's what he, he's telling here. He says, you, you need to give the more earnest heed. You need to give more attention. You need to give more focus. You need to pay attention to God's word, why it's more important than Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. And now you're going to go throughout the day going, I have that song in my head. Thank you, Pastor. I am sorry. But I said it, so I guess I'm not sorry. But anyways, so anyway, when he's talking about that, he is talking when, when we, he wants us to give heed to what? To the word of God. He wants us to give, when we read God's word, when we come to church, when we hear God's word preach, he wants us to give heed to it. He doesn't want us to be on our cell phones checking out, you know, if we can get a reservation for someplace to eat for lunch or, you know, see how things are going at home on your, on your phones because we all know that there's cameras that you can, you know, set up on your phone as well. He wants us to give heed to it. Why? Because this is life-changing 
your brisket is not. You say, Pastor, you don't know how life-changing it is after you have it. It's life-changing for a meal, but that's about it. All right. But the thing is, is that he wants us, to, obviously, like I said, to do that. Why? Because he doesn't want us to give in to every, every whim or every trend that comes, you know, that comes around. Because you know what? It's trendy at times to be a Christian, isn't it? To call yourself a Christian even though that you're not. Now, there's ones that will go around and say, I'm a Christian, have never stepped into a church, have no idea, idea who Jesus is. Because you say, oh, you're a Christian, so you believe in Jesus. I'm like, who's he? And you, you, would, you would think that, oh, America, you found upon Christian principles that people would know about Jesus. But more and more, as we go and knock door to door, you find out there's more and more people that have no idea who Jesus Christ is. You say, well, how is that possible? There's Christian TV and all this. Because people don't know. They don't go to church anymore. They, don't, they know there's a building down the street that's called a church, but they have no idea you know, why it's there. And so that's why if, they, if somebody comes to the door, you know, that is, they say, not us, like a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, they're going to listen to them. Why? Because they don't know any different. Right? And so he doesn't want us to give in to you know, being tossed to and fro, back and forth, by every wind of doctrine, as the Bible says. And he says, this is the reason why. He says, lest at any time we should let them slip. We don't want to slip in sound teaching and sound Bible doctrines and and those things that we know that the Bible teaches. Because the more that we are away from this book, the more we will get away from it. You say, well, Pastor, did you just repeat yourself? Yes, I did. Because the more you get away from it, the more you're going to get away from it. You're not going to understand. You're going to... you're, you're, uh, at times you're going to sit there and say, why doesn't you know, uh, God seem to speak to me as much as he used to? It's because you're not in his word. If you're not letting him talk to you, if you're not, letting him, you're not reading what he wrote and said for us to follow, then what is going to happen is, is that you are going to do what? You're slowly going to start slipping and start falling away, as the Bible says, and you're going to get into a backslidden state to where you don't realize what the Bible says, and you're going to go off of what Fox News, CNN, all these other places will tell you what the Bible says, and they have no idea what the Bible says. And they bank on that. They bank on the fact that you don't know, uh, you know what the Bible says. Like I said, the, doctrine, you know, the doctrines that we, have been, uh, that we have from the Bible... Instead of some, you know, uh, cl- uh, cleverly devised scheme or twistings of the Bible as we see in cults and all those as well, or, or as, as politicians like to say, well, I believe the Bible, and they'll take the Bible, and then they'll twist it. Obviously, we, obviously we need to be careful to, uh, to not allow sound Bible teaching to fall away from us. The Bible warns us of this, of, uh, of falling into false doctrine and false teaching in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, which says, Let no man deceive you by, uh, by any means, for that day shall not come except uh, there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The Bible tells us, don't fall away. He's saying, stay in the word. Stay in the word. And he's not saying, you know, this is not a matter of salvation on this. He's saying, you know what? I don't want you to get far away from it. Because, I mean, think about it. If a husband and a wife are far away from each other for a long, any long period of time, what ends up happening is that they start losing that connection with one another until they, you know, they come back, uh, you know, together and... and and be able to discuss whether it's a good situation or a bad situation. I'll tell you right now, I don't like it when I'm separated from my family. I mean, they could be visiting family, but I don't like it when they're gone. And some of you go, well, you know what? I kind of like it when they're gone because then it gets a little quieter around the house, and then I can, whatever. That only lasts for about a good half hour. I mean, because after that, I'm, like, I'm, I'm calling up my wife, calling up my daughter, saying, you know, you know when are you coming home? And you say, well, Pastor, you're a little bit different than I am. I guess I am because, you know, I love my family and I want to be around them. You know? So, but also, you know, he's referring to the fact, you know, that if we don't, if we start falling away, we are going to be put to shame. If we start falling away from, uh, uh, you know, following the Bible, what the Bible says, we are going to be uh, put to shame. And you know what? It's because, you know what? We're wasting our time on foolish things. I mean, what other stuff, what is more important than reading God's Word? And you'll say, well, Pastor, I mean, i got to do this, i got to do this. Always make time for the Word of God. Always. And I understand things happen, things come out, you know, things come out of nowhere sometimes, and you're going, okay, i got to go take care of this. But, you know, at least get like five minutes of time. 
You'll find that time, you know, uh, you know, let you, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 16 says, Thou art filled with the shame for glory, uh, drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's uh, right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. In other words, you are going to be put to shame when you don't heed God's word. When you don't listen to God's word, when you're not doing his word, that's what ends up happening. And the thing is, is that if believers would give heed to the warnings of the prophets, the messengers, the angels that were sent by God, but sent by the Lord, then we wouldn't have the just recompense for our, you know, for our reward. In other words, that we reap what we sow. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm a believer. How is it that I'm having such a rough and a hard time? You reap what you sow. If you're not reading God's word, you're not putting that time in, you're going to reap what you sow. If you allow the world to dictate your life, and not follow God's word. It's getting a little quieter now. But if you don't follow what God's word says, and we're not giving heed to it, and you're not following it, the thing is, is that we're going to get a reward for that. And you say, oh, what is that? It could be a lot worse than what you think. You, you know, it's the fact that you're going to get a reward, a just recompense for what you did. God will send people in your life to get your life straight. If you don't want to follow God's word, if you don't want to you know, take the time out of your day to do it, God will send somebody, whether they're saved or not saved, to try and get you to refocus upon where you're supposed to be with the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, Pastor God wouldn't do that. He does it all the time. He does it all the time. Why? Because he wants you on that straight and narrow path. He doesn't want you deviating, going off any other way you want to because you don't feel like you have the time to do it. I guarantee there are things in your life that you feel like I have to do. That you get up and you're like, I'm going to go do this. Like work. Tell me how, long, how many times that you can miss work before your boss says you're fired. Amen to the fact that God doesn't ever say you're fired after you're saved. But he wants you to come back into that relationship. He wants you to be reconciled in that relationship if you have been backsliding, if you've been getting away from him. I mean, think about this. What does the Bible say in regards to, uh, to uh, uh, Lot and his wife? What ended up happening to Lot's wife when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed? She turned around, right? Didn't listen to the Lord. She didn't give heed to what the Lord had, and told, her, you know, had told her to do, which was just keep running, don't look back. And she didn't do it. And she got turned into a pillar of salt. And uh, Luke 17, 32, the Bible simply says this about her. Remember Lot's wife. You say, I can't, re I can't memorize scripture. Remember Lot's wife. Three words. And the thing is, is that's to remind us to do, uh, you know what, that we reap what we sow. If we are reading God's word, we are putting in the time with it, we're going to reap benefits from that. If we, if we don't, we push it off to the side, we're going to reap the not-so-good benefits of that, right? And so, when, as I said earlier, the word neglect does not refer to, like, lost salvation or losing your salvation or any of that kind of stuff because we know that you can't do that. You can't, you know, there's no way you can, you can lose it once you're saved. But it simply means that you are, properly, you are not properly attending to it. Like I said earlier, your house, if you don't take care of your house, it will fall apart. If you don't take care of your car, you don't give it oil changes, you don't do any of that kind of stuff, what's going to happen? It's going to fall apart. It's not going to work right. There's a reason why some people's cars will last like 300, 350,000 miles, even more so. Because why? Because they do basic maintenance on it to keep it going. You say, well, that's impossible. I don't, I've never heard of a car. You need to talk to Bobby McKay. He, he has a vehicle right now that is on 350,000 miles. Why? Because he just keeps on doing the maintenance on it. Keeps it going. You say, well, I want all the new technology and everything else. You know, I really have a vehicle that runs. Because all the stuff, all this new technology, that's just more stuff for, you know, to mess up, to break. When I got, you know, uh, a few years ago, when I got my truck, uh, some people, you know, said, hey, Pastor, you don't really have all that much on this thing. This truck right now has the most technology I've ever had in a vehicle. It has power windows, it has power door locks, and it has a radio. You say, what you have before? Some of the, uh, the older generation may know this. You remember those windows? Did you go like this? That's what I had before. You say, what about, you know, with the door locks? That's what I had. And you know what? Never had to worry about the, uh, the motor going bad on it either. Unless my arm was all of a sudden hurting and I, you know, pulled a muscle, then I might have to, like, you know, stretch over for it or something like that. 
But I never had to worry about that. I thought it was a great thing. The first car that I had, the CD player, that was the first year the CD player on a car was considered to be standard. I didn't have to get the option of a CD player. And some of the kids were going, what are CDs? <laughs> and then some of the older generation goes, I remember 8-tracks, and I remember... I don't think you had a record player in your car. I don't know if that's possible, but because you had a couple bumps, you might be skipping your, uh, you know, the record the entire time. But like I said, if you don't take care of those things, you don't take care of your vehicles, you don't take care of your house, you don't take care of your relationships, they will fall apart. If you don't take care of your relationship with the Lord, you don't put the time in with the Lord, it's going to begin to fall apart. Life is going to begin to fall apart. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're going to be sitting there going, how did this happen? You know what? And Jesus has been there the entire time in the same place that you left him. And he's saying, you know what? Let's, let's reconcile this relationship. Let's get things back on track and let's go. Just so you know that you know, when that happens, the Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you've reconciled that relationship with the Lord and you're getting condemned, it's not from the Lord. The Bible, you know, you know, the Bible says that we will be convicted about certain things, but we're not going to get condemned. We're not going to get constantly beat down over and over again. Because if we've made that relationship right with the Lord, he's like, hey, just keep moving forward. Keep going. Keep going. He's going to want to keep us to keep on strengthening and encouraging ourselves in the Lord and all those things. This is the way that uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, uh, you know, uh, puts it. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your, salva your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is what the Bible is saying. This is what the Bible means with what I just said. is the fact of you need to keep working out. And how many know that if you work out, you work out your, your physical body? That's work. So is, you know, your salvation and trembling. Why? Because you're reading God's word. You're getting in there and saying, you know what? How can God change me? You're not just reading the word of God, but you're saying, you know what? The Bible tells me to do this. I'm going to do it. You're applying it to your life. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we need to do. It goes on you know, further in verse 2, it's, or sorry, verse 3. It says this, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, which was what? The prophets, the apostles, all those in the Bible. He's saying, you know what? This is what we, he's saying, don't neglect it. Why? Because, for one thing, they're the ones that, you know, that heard from the Lord, wrote it down, so that way we could have the Word of God. But how many times have you heard a person go over to somebody's house, they have a Bible on their dining room, or not dining room, but their uh, living room table, and as soon as you move that Bible, you see that nice rectangle that's clean because there's all dust around it. And the, you know, God doesn't want us to leave that only like when we need it. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus every hour. I need him all, all the time. In verse 4, it says this. It says, uh, it says God also bearing, witness, uh, bearing them witness bo uh, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy, uh, Holy Ghost according to his own will. The Lord showed us, uh, uh, showed in who he, uh, who he used. How did God show, uh, show people that he was using somebody, that somebody was a prophet, somebody was an apostle, somebody was a believer. It was by their testimony. And it was to be, what, by, believed by signs and wonders. We saw that with the apostles. The, the apostles did all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles. Obviously, Jesus did as well in signs of the Holy Ghost. The Old Testament uh, prophets showed this. Jesus, you know, uh, showed this as well. And obviously, the apostles did as well. And obviously... When you look at some of the signs and wonders, some of them were pretty strange, weren't they? Some of them were pretty weird. I mean, think about it. There was one man, you know, in the Bible, I believe it was Hezekiah, who the, the Lord said, sleep on one side for a certain amount of time. And then after that, switch over to the other side. You go, well, that doesn't seem strange. Okay. Well, then you also have, let's look at John the Baptist. What did he do to show people that he was from the Lord? Well, he dressed in camel's hair, and then he ate locust and honey. The honey I can get down with. The locust, I don't think so. I mean, you can sit there and be like, oh, that's protein. That's no, I don't know about you. Of course, I guess if I wanted to, I'd, I'd never go hungry down here, because if that's the case, if bugs are, you know, are, uh, 
our protein. You know, we got a, a whole bunch of mosquitoes down here. I, I mean, I'm telling you, I could be just, you know, just keep going. But I, I, I could share you a, a story about mosquitoes, but I'm not going to. It's just, it's just, if you want to know it, I'll, I'll tell you later, but I'm not going to. It's gross. All right, so number one is this. Don't neglect the salvation that God has given you. Don't neglect the salvation. Number two is that you're subject to Christ, not angels. You're subject to Christ, not angels. This is verse, verses 5 through 8. Verse 5 says this. It says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Again, we see the fact because the Jewish people, the Hebrews at this time, kept on you know, looking towards angels, and they kept on holding angels in high esteem and high regard. And Paul comes back, he said, you know, begins to like flex on the Jews again and say, you know, about their, you know, about their thoughts and their traditions and say, you know what? They're nothing. The angels are nothing compared to Christ. It says the world to come. It's talking about the kingdom of Christ, you know, his soon coming reign that he will have. The angels have no authority unless given by the Lord. And that includes Satan himself. You know that? The angels have no authority unless given by the Lord. That includes Satan himself. You say, Pastor, you know, where is that? Go read Job chapter 1. Job had to, or sorry, uh, Satan had to come to Job, or sorry, not to Job, to God, to ask for permission to go after Job. And that's the same thing today. Nothing has changed. So this, maybe some of the things that you're going through realize that God has allowed it. Doesn't mean that God's okay with it, but he allowed it, Right? And if God allowed it, the Bible says that, you know what, that he's going to give you the ability to stand up to that temptation. He's not going to give you more than you can handle. The Bible even says that he's not going to give us more than uh, you uh, you can handle. That whatever uh, temptation is there, the Bible says that, you know what, you are able to handle it. Whatever you're going through, I mean, you may have the the worst time in life. You may have a whole bunch, bunch of death in your family or something like that. But God knows you can handle it. You may not think so, but God, you know, believes in you more than you do. God knows what you can handle. And if you say, you know what, I can't handle it, lean upon the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. And what? He will direct your paths. He was also going to uh, judge the living and the dead. Jesus Christ is going to judge the living and the dead. It's not up to Satan to judge you. Uh, Satan's going to accuse you because he is the accuser of the brethren, but he has, he's not going to judge you. God does. God's going to ju- uh, judge the living and the dead. In verses uh, 6 through 8, the beginning part, uh, part of verse uh, 8, he is quoting Psalm 8, chapter, uh, Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. Let's read. It says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with uh, glory and honor. And didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast uh, put all things in subjection under his feet. And obviously, you know, this morning the kids learned about the fact that, you know what, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the gospel, right? Well, you know what, the Bible says that all these evil things and everything else in this world, he's already put under subjection, you know, uh, to the Lord, that they are under his feet. It says, thou, uh, thou madest him a little lower than the angels, Right? Well, the thing is, is that this is speaking of Jesus Christ, you know, and the Bible is not saying that angels are more powerful than Jesus. Because some people would read that and they say, well, that, you know, the God was made a little bit, that Jesus was made a little bit lower than the angels. That's not what it is saying here. What it is, it is speaking of Jesus coming to earth in the flesh, that he put on the flesh. That's what he means by a little bit lower. Why? Because humans are known as to be made a little bit lower than the angels. But here's the thing. Whereas we're 100% human, which he was, he was 100% human, he's also 100% God, and we're not. You say, well, Pastor, that's 200%, how does that work? I don't know, ask him. He's the one who's 100% God, 100% man. And that's what it's referring to, is that he put on humanity to do what? To suffer for us. It's also explained in verse 9, if you look at verse 9, it says this, it says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for everyone. That's the reason why he came, was to taste death for everyone. Let's look at the, 
the, the, uh, the, the verse 7, it says, uh, sorry, no, verse 8, the latter part of it, where it says, um, but now we, uh, we see not all things that are put under him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24 says, says Then come, uh, comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall uh, have put, all, uh, put down all rule and authority and power. The thing is, is that all things are un, uh, underneath him. All things are under his feet. Everything is subject to him. Everything, uh, all, all authority is under, you know, is sorry, we are under his authority. Even though his enemies still wage war, but the final blow, uh, the blow, uh, final blow is coming to Satan when, when Satan, his angels, and those who believe not on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation uh, uh, will be cast into the lake of fire along with death and hell. Just so I want to uh, let you know, this is in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, but I want you to you know, realize this. Hell is not eternal. Do you know that? Some of you going. Some of you popped up on that one. Hell is not eternal. You say, how is that possible? Well, flip over to uh, Revelation chapter twenty, verse fourteen. What does it say? It says, "And death and hell were what." Cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So hell is not eternal. The lake of fire is. So don't go around saying, Pastor's a heretic, because he said hell is not eternal. Most people think of hell, and they think it's uh, eternal. But it says right there, it says death and hell are cast into what? The lake of fire. The lake of fire is eternal, not hell. And so it doesn't matter anyways, because you know what? It's all torment and, and, uh, and torture and suffering and pain anyways. One man put it like this. He says, as Christ carries on a war continually with various enemies, it is, it is doubtless and, uh, evident that he has no quiet possession of his kingdom. He is not, however, under the, necess- uh, the, necess- the necessity of waging war, but it happens through his will that his enemies are not to be subdued until the last day in order that we may be tried and proven, uh, proved by fresh exercises. In other words, you know what? At any moment, any time, he could say, you know, that everything is underneath him. But the thing is, is that he allows certain things to happen to do what? To test us, to try us. He allows Satan to, you know, uh, you know to send out his angels to do certain things and have certain things about us. Why? To try us, to test us in those things. But on the last day, those will all end. Those will all end. So number one was don't neglect this great salvation. Number two was that we are subject to Christ and not to angels. And number three is this, that Jesus trust, uh, tasted death for every man. Jesus tasted death for every man. Verse 9, I read it earlier, but I'll read it again. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that, uh, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, if you have uh, anybody that you know that as a Calvinist or goes to, like I say, a Presbyterian church or a Reformed church or any of those kind of churches, this verse kind of annihilates their theory, you know what, that Jesus didn't die for anybody or didn't die for everybody, but he only died for the elect. They'll say he only died for the saved people. The other ones, he already determined that they're going to go to hell anyways. That's what Calvinists believe. But what does the Bible say? It says what? That he tasted death for how many men? A few? It says every man, right? Every man. So let's look at this, that he tasted death for every man. So what does this mean? Some say, oh, death, physical death. It's, me, it's even deeper than that. It's even deeper than that that is not just a physical death you know, that he suffered for us. I mean, we know that God put on flesh, you know, as I said earlier, a little lower than the angels, yet the angels are subject to him, right, to suffer a gruesome beating, right? So we see this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 20, uh, 53 that says, Thinkest thou that I cannot uh, now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? I mean, think about it. If angels are more powerful than Jesus Christ, Jesus said, you know what? I could just sit there at any moment, just call you know, 12 legions of angels down. 
they are subject to him. It's not the other way around. That at any moment he, that he could have, he, on the cross, he could have you know, just said, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm tired of this. And sent for 12 legions of the angels to take him away. All that uh, beating and suffering that he went through. I mean, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 says this. It says, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of of many, and unto, uh, unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus, you know, uh, this is in his death that uh, what was accomplished, you know, through that beating. First uh, Peter chapter 2 verse 24 says, who his own self bear our sins in where? In his own body. Our sins he bore in, our, in his own body. He took upon his body right? On the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Oftentimes people will quote this verse saying, I claim healing in Jesus' name or all this other stuff, but what it is, if you are saved, that's what it's saying. It says, by his stripes you are healed. You are saved. That's what it actually literally means. It's not, you know, something for, you know, for healing. It is for your, your spiritual healing, if you want to look at it that way. There is a healing... But the thing is, as soon as you're saved, it says what? It says that, uh, that by his stripes you are healed. But I want us to focus on that part that says, our sins in his own body, that he bore our sins in his own body. Because obviously, you know, there, Jesus died and was buried, right? And the Bible actually says that his spirit descended into hell to accomplish victory over death, hell, and the grave, to pay for sin that he bore in his body. And you say, where, where does that say that in the Bible? Well, let me tell you. Let me show you. If you want to, flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. Ephesians 4, verse 8, the Bible reads, Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that, he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also what? Descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. You say, well, it doesn't say hell. It just says that he went to the lower parts of the earth. Well, let's continue to read because, you know what, I mean, there's, there's other verses. If you want to, flip over to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, that Jesus not only accomplished our salvation physically, but it was a spiritual salvation that he had to do. So he actually literally descended into hell to pay for your sins and my sins. Okay? Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, I am he that liveth. And was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. How can Jesus have the keys of hell and death if he didn't go there? You think Satan all of a sudden came up and said, Here, here's my keys, I'm sorry. We say, well, Pastor, I still doesn't say anything. Okay, well, flip over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, the Bible reads, For as Jonas was three days and three nights, and Jonas is Jonah, is three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You say, well, that says heart of the earth. It still doesn't say hell. Where do you think hell is located? You say, okay, well, I don't know. Well, let me see. what. Let's go where Jonah says of this entire situation. Go over to Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. I am simply, you know, showing you that Jesus went to hell to purchase salvation. You say, well, so far all you're doing is just point, pointing to these verses that kind of allude to it, but doesn't really say it. Let's keep going. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 says, And said, this is Jonah, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me, and out of the belly, belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. You say, well, that's only for Jonah that he felt like when he was inside the belly of the whale that it was like hell. It's actually a dual prophecy. It was talking about the fact of him being in the belly of the whale, and he thought, felt like that was hell. But it also refers to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus referred to it in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, where he says that he was going to, what, spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth or in hell. 
Jonah, like I said, prays literally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, prays to the Lord literally to get him out of the well in which he calls uh, hell. Yet Jesus speaks uh, Jonah's prayer in reference to where he would be. And you say, still, Pastor, I still don't know. Go over to Acts chapter 2. I said, I'm still waiting for that, you know, one that says that Jesus was in hell. Well, here you go. Acts chapter 2, verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Drop down to verse 31. He seeing this before speck of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, who? Jesus' soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. The Bible flat out says that Jesus was in hell, but God wouldn't allow him to see corruption. Why was he doing that? He was making payment for your sins that you could never make payment for. I mean, what do we think that Jesus was doing for three days and three nights? Taking a nap? He said, well, he was dead. Well, what happens to your soul? When you die, it doesn't stay in the body, either it goes to heaven or hell. Well, he bore our sins in his body. He went down and he, uh, he took those sins and you know what? basically you know, took out the devil and said, you know what, they're forgiven. He did everything possible for us to be forgiven. He even, like I said, his soul even went down to hell to make payment for our sins. He was the only one who could do it. Why? Because he was the pure, uh, spotless, blameless Lamb of God. He is the only one who could accomplish it. And we know that, obviously it says, you know what? It says, this Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. What does that mean? That when they're talking on the day of Pentecost, Peter is saying, you know what? I witnessed him raising from the dead. He says, and I know that he went down to hell to take care of my sins, to pardon me from all my sins, to, give, to, to ransom me away from those sins. I mean, and this is the reason why when you read Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to what? All men. God made it possible. Jesus Christ made it possible upon the cross, upon his death, upon his burial, upon his resurrection, that all men could be saved. But we know that not all men will be saved. Why? Because they don't want to receive him. Do you know what's ironic in the fact that when you go door to door and you talk to somebody about how easy it is to get saved, that people will still reject it? They'll say, well, no, I need, to, I need to do something more. I, I, I mean, there has to be, I mean, I have to be able to pay for it. If you could pay for it, you wouldn't need Jesus. And there ain't a, a, any amount of money in the world. There's not you know, anything in this world that would you know, pay for that. But Jesus paid for it. That's what Jesus did, you know, the death, burial, res- you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of him, that he provided salvation for all, even though that all would not receive him, despite what the Calvinists say, and then, you know, say that he only provided salvation for those who would be saved, which is a crock, because the Bible over and over again says that he provided salvation to all men, right? It's, that he tasted death for every man. They must, you know, take a, you know, a sharpie and just scribble those out when they don't like them. And think about this, even further going into this. In the Old Testament, the burnt offering re- uh, represented atonement for sin, for forgiveness of sin, right? And, and, uh, and that was supposed to be continued, it was supposed to be offered day in and day, not, uh, you know, day in, day out, night and day, it was supposed to be offered. Well, the Old Testament burnt offering was a foreshadowing, but the thing is, is that it was never good enough. Why? Because Jesus became the burnt offering for us. So we didn't, that's the reason why you're going to see later on in Hebrews where he talks about, he says, you know what? You don't have to sacrifice anymore. There's no reason to sacrifice. Why? Because he was our sacrifice once and for all. You don't have to keep on going, you know, to the temple and offering and killing all these animals. I mean, the, the AS, you know, PCA or whatever, that, you know, that's on TV would probably have a problem if you had to, you know, keep, keep going, killing Fluffy and Rover and Rex and all those other ones just so, you, uh, you know, you wouldn't sin. I mean, think about it. 
That's what you had to do. Why? Because you know what? I mean, probably as soon as you got home, you're like, oh, man, I had a stupid thought. I got to go. Because, you know, the Bible says the thoughts of foolishness are sin. So you say, oh, I had a stupid thought. I got to go back. Another one. Oh, I can't. I stubbed my toe and I said a word that I shouldn't have said. I mean, I don't know about you. If you're a farmer and you have all these animals, you're going to watch your mouth and your actions. Why? Because you know what? Sooner or later, you're going to be like, I can't afford to live on a farm anymore because I keep on killing all my animals because I keep on messing up. So number one was, do not neglect uh, this great salvation, that you are subject to Christ, not angels. That, and, uh, number three, Jesus tasted death for every man. Number four is this, that you, are, you have been delivered from the fear of death and spiritual bondage. You have, if you're saved, you have been delivered from the fear of death and spiritual bondage. There's one or two that you know like that. I mean, think about it. What did I just say? You have, not you're going to be, but you have been delivered from the fear of death and spiritual bondage. Let's look at verses uh, you know, uh, 10 through 11. It says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things in being uh, many sons, unto glory, to make the captain, uh, captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which, uh, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus, it says, Jesus is the captain of our salvation that was made, uh, you know, that's perfectly done through his sufferings. What? He was the perfect sacrifice, and he suffered for it. Why? So we could be saved. It says, why? It says, bringing many sons unto glory. Salvation is given to all, as I said earlier, but not all will receive it. It says, bringing many sons. Why? Because he knows that there will be people that will be saved, but he also knows that there are going to be people, uh, be people that won't. Despite what Oprah Winfrey thinks. Oprah Winfrey thinks that, you know, uh, just believe whatever you want to and everybody's going to uh, go to heaven. If you want to believe in Buddha, you know, that he's God, or if you want to believe that Allah is God, or if you want to believe whatever, all roads lead to heaven, according to her. That if God is a loving God, why would he want to send anybody to hell? That's her logic for it. So she says, you know what, they may suffer for a little bit, but God's going to ultimately love wins. I said, the last time I checked, we're not Catholic. We don't pay penance, and then all of a sudden we're like allowed to get in which is not in the Bible, by the way. I mean, think about this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, later on in the book, he says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now think about what it says, the author and finisher. What he has started in you, he will bring to completion. He's not going to let you just sit out there and say, okay, you started it, now go ahead and do it. I mean, that would be like me going you know, uh, to a master contractor. The master contractor you know, uh, kind of starts framing a house and just, he says, okay, have at it. You know who I'm going to be calling? Tim. But if God saves you, he's going to finish that. You're saved. So he says, you know what? You're already, you know, you're already saved. He says, I'm going to finish what has been started. I am the author and the finisher. I am the one that wrote salvation. I'm the one that provided salvation. And I'm the one that is going to finish your salvation and bring you into glory. Because of his sacrifice, it says that he is not ashamed to call us Brethren. Because we're saved, the Bible says that he's not ashamed of us, that he calls us brethren or brothers, that we, are, that we are a family, that we are in the family of God. Verse 12 is, verse 12 is quoting Psalm 22, uh, verse uh, 22, and that entire uh, psalm it refers to Jesus and his suffering. So let's look at, you know, look at verse uh, 12. It says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, and in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Who is he talking to? He says, you know, that he's talking to his brethren that who are, are aware. In case you don't know where it is, he says, in the, in the church. Where do, where do believers meet? In the church. Verse 13, it says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, uh, behold, I and 
the, the children which, uh, which God hath given me. And these are all references. This actually is, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, and these are references of praising the Lord. Now, I want us to focus on verses 14 and 15, which says this. It says, for as, much then are, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of, part of the same, that through death he might destroy, that, uh, to destroy him that had the power of death. Now, look at that word that he had. He doesn't have it anymore. He had it. He doesn't have... If you had something, you don't have it right now, right? It says that had the power of death, that is the devil. So the devil had power, the power of death, he doesn't have it anymore. And deliver them uh, who through fear of death were all, uh, were all their lifetime subject to to bondage. He destroyed the devil's power of death to deliver us from the fear of death. I mean, think about it. Anyone outside of Christ who says that they don't fear death is lying to you or they're putting on a front. Because every single person that when it comes down to it, if they are laying on their deathbed, you will see sheer terror in their eyes when they don't know the Lord. But it's those that do know the Lord that have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Because we know where we're going. Those that don't know the Lord have the fear of the unknown. They don't know where they're going. They have an idea probably, but they don't know. We need to realize that believers need not to fear death. We don't need to fear death. Oftentimes I've met people say, well, I hope that I'm going, you know, that I go to heaven. Well, to me, when a person makes that, you know, uh, you know that, that saying is the fact that they don't realize that Jesus Christ has saved them. Or, you know what, that they are not saved in the first place, that they've been going to church and playing it, and they think that they're saved, but they're not. Because the thing is, is that we should not fear death. I'm not saying that I want, you know, like, hey, come on, death, bring it, you know, bring it home now. But I'm saying, when my time comes, I'm ready. I'm ready. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 54, says this. says, So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this uh, mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall, uh, shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth uh, us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to fear death. He says, where's your sting? Where's your victory? Where's all these things? It means nothing. Why? Because you know what? We have the victory. He gave us the victory when he died for us upon that cross and raised from the dead. That his salvation is enough to save us. It's not the fact that we sit there and we go, oh, gee, I wonder if I made it. But the thing is, is glory to God. I don't have to fear death anymore. Why? Because I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. That's what we need to realize, that, when, that we should never neglect our salvation. The reason being is because, you know what? I don't want my salvation to be in shambles. But I want it to be presented to the Lord and say, you know what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the Lord. That when I go stand before him, I say, Lord, I did everything that I possibly could for you. Not that he's going to love me anymore, but because, you know what? That's what pleases him, and I want to please my father. That's what I want to do. So many times people are like, you know what, I'm just happy getting to heaven. You probably met quite a few people that are like, you know what, I'm glad that I'm saved and I'm good. And they just sit and they sit and they sit and they never, they never do anything else to, from what the Bible says. I don't know about you, but I want to do everything possible to bring every single person that I come in contact with to go to heaven. I mean, there are people, you know, that are shocked and surprised that when we come over and we tell them the gospel, some that were enemies that are now saved that are no longer enemies. Because you know why? Because once you've passed from, uh, from darkness unto light, things change and God changes you. Amen? So don't neglect your, uh, you know, your salvation. You are subject to Christ, not angels. Jesus tasted death for every man. You are delivered from death and spiritual bondage. And lastly, Jesus took the nature of mankind, not the nature of angels. 
Jesus took the nature of mankind and not of angels. Verse 16 says this, For verily he took not on the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus, Jesus didn't come to save angels. Jesus came to save humanity. So he took on flesh to do that. He came right down with us. The Bible says here in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be uh, touched with the, uh, the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus did everything possible to see how, uh, how it feels you know, to us every time, that we, whatever, but yet he said, you know what, I'm not going to sin. So when we think that, you know, if Jesus stubbed his toe, yes, it did hurt. Why? Because he's in flesh. Was there times where Jesus, you know, felt really, really, you know, tired and stuff? Yes, we know this. Well, for one thing, the Bible, you know, tells us that he stayed up until late hours of the night praying for us. So the things that we go through, sometimes we say, well, that's Jesus. He didn't, no, Jesus, is, what does it say? That he was in all points tempted as we are, yet was without sin. We have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. We are in Christ. The Bible says, if we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, it says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. What does this mean? Romans chapter 8, verse 17. If children, then heirs. He is speaking of believers. If children, then heirs. Heirs, to God, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. In other words, we didn't just get salvation when we got saved. The Bible says that we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. That we are children, that we are in God's family that we are heirs according to the promise, that if God promises it, he's not going to lie. You inherit the blessings promised to Abraham and partake of the happiness to which he looked forward. To, uh, he looked forward. You have become truly heirs of God, and this is in accordance with the promise made to Abraham. It is not by the obedience of the law, which that would be the fact of like you know different you know one's author saying I just need to keep the law because we don't we aren't saved by you know by obedience to the law it is by faith and in the same way that Abraham possessed the blessing as an arrangement before giving of the law and therefore one that may be uh, that may include all whether Jews or Gentiles all are on on a level and are alike. And all are alike the children of God, and in the same manner, and on the same terms that Abraham was. Galatians 3, 7 says, Know ye therefore that, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So the Bible says that, you know what? What he was promised, we are promised. We are, uh, we are saved what? by grace through faith. I close with this. I want us to realize that we, don't, we should not neglect our salvation. Yes, will there be people that neglect it and don't take care of it and, and you know, kind of uh, you know, put a black eye upon Christianity? Yes. Don't let that be you. Don't sit there and say, well, I'm not, you know, you know they, they can live this way. They can do whatever they want. Well, the Bible says that everything is lawful, but not everything is expedient or beneficial. So whereas you say, well, I'm saved, I can do whatever I want, you know what? It's not always beneficial to do everything that you want. And so I want to ask this question. So if you're not saved this morning, I, what I want to ask for you to do, you say, you know what, I, I want to get this salvation, I, I, want, I want this salvation. What I want you to do if you're not saved is to come up here to the altar and that we will help you and lead you to Christ so you can be saved. And number two is this, is that if you have been neglecting your salvation, that Jesus gave up so much to provide for us, and remember, he gave it to you, not the angels, that we need to realize and begin, you know what, 
Maybe we need to be reconciled back to God and say, you know what, I'm sorry for neglecting the salvation that you gave me. I'm sorry that, you know, that, you know what, I know that you tasted death for every man, and I'm sorry that, you know what, I've made it less than what it is. So for the next few moments, if you want to get saved, come forward, and if, or, or you say, you know what, I've been neglecting the you know, salvation that God has given me. I want to make things right this morning and say, you know what, I don't want to neglect it anymore. But I want to be reconciled. Uh, I, I want to make that, uh, that relationship back to where it was. I want to begin to work out my faith with fear and trembling once again. If that's you, I just ask that you would come forward.